All right, pals. I will not call you jabronis tonight. <laughs> Let's feel that one in your heart, at which point imagine that I have. Uh, this uh, first poem is named after a meatloaf song, and it's called Peel Out. I've been eating a bag of clementines a day. I googled how many oranges do you have to eat a day before it kills you, <laughs> feeling ambivalent about the answer. One of the things worth living for is eating a bag of clementines a day. I leave a fine spray of sticky juice across my computer screen. My nails and fingertips are turning that sickly nicotine yellow that boys love to write about. But this time it's not cigarettes, it's eating a bag of clementines a day. This is the kind of thing where people say, well, if that's your only vice, but it isn't my only vice, I also like cigarettes and tequila and video games and sex and impressing people who give tours of breweries with my superior knowledge of yeast <laughs> and worrying about my receding hairline and drinking sparkling water by the two litre bottle until I piss every 15 minutes. But I'm not eating a bag of any of those a day, I'm eating a bag of clementines a day. Thank you. <laughs> What I've just done there is trick you, because that is the only book of poem in this book that has jokes in it. Uh, the rest of the set is sad. Um, cool, and I'm going to really fucking hammer that home with this poem. Um, yeah, fuck me. Uh, there is a content note on this um, for the death of loved ones, particularly in car crashes, car crashes. Years after the car crash. Emma tagged me and 24 friends in an advert for knockoff Ray-Bans. Whoever hacked her Facebook doesn't know that she is dead. The last time we were together, we fell asleep stoned on the sofa of her terraced student house. We were secretly holding hands. I didn't tell my girlfriend. I didn't want it to mean something. Before then, we had kissed in stairwells, wandered drunk through Brandon Hill. We were always trying to prove how impossible it was to die. At the funeral, the priest called Emma an undying servant of God. But we knew her cider-lipped and happy. Brilliant. Gorse fire on the Welsh hills. I hated everyone in the church for their refusal to say who she really was, for calling her undying when she was so clearly dead. I wondered if the man in a cast was the driver of the other car. We skipped out on the wake and went to a Weatherspoons. I thought I saw her there at a high table. A smile, a full glass raised. I did not know how to say goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Um, bring up ever so slightly from that, potentially, maybe. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, this is a pro. Uh, so I grew up in Cornwall, and a lot of things in this book are about growing up in Cornwall and the sea and stuff, and also dads, but we'll get to the notion of dads in a bit. Um, this poem is called Prar Sands. And then there was my best friend's body, broader and hairy in a way I had not noticed before, and me in bed waiting for him to strip down to his boxes, both of us fresh out of the shower, drunk still. I took him in my arms and joked a kiss onto his shoulder. He shrank inwards like a sea anemone, prodded by the guileless finger of a tourist. He told me that Maddie was the only person to ever spoon him, and he could not bear it. I rolled away and thought about the glow-in-the-dark stars my parents had, constant, had scattered across my bedroom ceiling, how much barer this ceiling was without them. Luke lay on his side, a body of jutting Cornish rock, forming a bay in the sheets between us. And the sea was spread out, like it had been earlier that night as we stripped down to our boxers and ran towards the waves, pressing our thighs into the oncoming water, cleaving through to find it constellated with bioluminescent water bugs. The nighttime sea was dense with them, but each time we tried to catch one, it flickered out in our palms. The ocean rippled out from us like the surface of the bed we shared. We were a quiet coastline, holding something unspoken between us, unwilling to let it go. Um, in a very unprofessional manner, I didn't plan this set and I've been currently running it on a vibes only setup. Um, how am I doing for time? Uh, 
five minutes. Cool, we're halfway. Incredibly yeah, professional yeah, yeah, for me yeah, to ask yeah. them. Uh, <laughs> this, <Wow>. is, <laughs> uh, this is uh, a newish poem. Um, it's called Natty Dubs. Um, it's about natural wine. So, thanks, shout out to my natural wine dad, uh, Joshua Judson. Um, <laughs> Uh, I like wine tastings because it's fun to feel my principles collapse under the weight of a single hour of luxury. <laughs> I like it, it was a joke. <laughs> Same reason I like hotels with high thread cam sheets, a decent pillow. Sometimes I imagine myself so unbothered, my tongue laden with a sweet oyster foam. Two pet naps down and I'm trying to convince a stranger of the benefits of automated luxury hedonism. I keep telling them about the machinations of the modern church of Satan. Sure, Baphomet's had some bad press, but you have to see past that. <laughs> Someone asks, what defines a natural wine? And we all laugh. Fucking oh. dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows it's the taste of peach pit, foot bottom, orange rind, sweat on the upper lip. Organic wines aren't necessarily natural, it's more of a vibe thing. Every time the sommelier says, terroir, that was French, high cliffside red soil, I think, terror. Think the last water on earth drawn up into this grape. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to do two more. I've been writing, um, like end of the world poems and party poems, so I'm just going to do one of those. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Oh, I wonder why, you might ask. Um, things are fine. Uh, do you want a poem with horses in or a poem with sex in? Sex in. That was so fucking strange. Um, the horse poem does also kind of have sex in it, but it's different. Um, uh, this poem uh, was written with uh, my friend Sam Fain. Uh, she's a fantastic American poet. We co wrote this together. Uh, it's called the first house party after the rapture. Plagues are such a buzzkill. St. Peter is suddenly out of a job. Nothing good can be born to us. So we fuck, but politically. All the same crying in the bathroom and worrying if we're acting hot and bored enough. All the same, sorry, this has been happening a lot recently. Turns out discovering you're irredeemable is kind of a boner killer. Turns out you can't even come when it's raining frogs and there's no pressure to moan. Do you even know who you're fucking? Their face a wall of teeth, their mouth a stone rolled back from the opening of a tomb. When they want you on top again, you say, okay. And use the opportunity to hold eye contact and tell them you're going to adopt one of the newly wild horses. You've got to ride out on something. You tell them to call you Harbinger. You close your eyes and picture yourself sitting, disco miserable, in the corner downstairs while a glowing girl dances in front of you. You imagine leaving with her in a burst of light. Mm. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I promise, uh, I promise I mentioned that we get to the notion of dance. Everything that exists. Um, so I wrote, I wrote this load of poems about my dad. I love my dad. He's a lovely man. But um, I like, I don't know. I was bothered about the notion of dads. Um, and I wrote a poem which, like, he was uh, was called uh, a dog named Father, and he was incredibly nice about the fact that I'd done this to him. Um, and I showed it to one of my mates, and they were like, "Do you fucking hate Bill Chris?" I was like, "No, Bill's sound." Um, so I wrote a poem that was kind of a weird apology for all the shit I'd said about him. Um, and this is called "Ars Poetica with Dad." All right, Dad. You're in this poem now, and I've dressed you in a brown t-shirt with Geology Rocks printed on it. Like the one we bought you for your birthday. I'm here too. It's not our first rodeo. But this time, I, won't promi I promise I won't make you a woodsman, or a bell ringer, or a dog. And I won't be Jesus Christ in eyeliner, or a fish with its belly split open. I hope in this poem, we don't become distant men on Bob Hickok's dusky hills. I hope this time we can talk. Maybe you'll say my best boy at the seaside of this poem, mm. or sat opposite me in a university town coffee shop, and then I can concentrate on the alliterative quality of parental love, or the repeating shapes of it. And maybe I'll tell you that, despite all the other poems, it doesn't really matter that you're terrible at saying I love you at the end of phone calls, not when you do such a good job of showing it. And I'll apologize for never giving you credit, for calling you archetype rather than dad, 
I started telling people that I love you during poetry shows, like this one, that you're a good guy. Middle-aged men confess their regrets to me, pat my shoulder, linger, pretend I'm their son. My other dad, Seamus Heaney, <laughs> wrote his pen into a gun and shot his father into the past with it. I've made mine a fence, a polished axe handle, a series of blunt objects. Maybe now, like Seamus, I can make a shovel of it and unearth my dad from the wintry soil. Thank you so much. Woo!